How are you guys doing? Oh my goodness. I am back at DU. Oh, so wonderful to be here to see my Denver United family. Oh, love you guys. It has been an emotional experience just walking around the church and uh, getting to say hi to you guys and catching up and hope to do more of that after the service as well. But, and I love how, you know, Daniel got to, you know, roast me, you know, like, uh, that was perfect. You know, I, I'm not going to bring up any of the things that he said when he's up here, okay? But, um, no, it's great to be here. Uh, I just, I love this church family uh, so much. And uh, if you are new here, let me tell you, stick around, because this is an awesome crew. And uh, Rob and Mari are incredible pastors. They are shepherds at heart, humble authentic, love Jesus, and they love you. This staff loves you. They pray for you. They care for you. Uh, and this is a wonderful place to be. So this is a home. This church is a family. So, and for those of you who've been here, you know that. Amen. Um, so it's great. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, a little update on what's happening with us. As you, most of you know, uh, we moved out to Kansas City in June of last year, and then I started as the lead pastor of our church out in Liberty, Missouri uh, in August, and so I've been pastoring out there for six, seven months or so now, and uh, it's been wonderful. We've enjoyed it. Our kids are doing great. They plugged into an awesome school out there. If you guys know our kids, they're like super extroverts like to the nth degree. So they made friends immediately. Like within a couple of weeks, we had neighbors, kids running around our house that we didn't know. And we're like, who, hey, who are you? You know? And so they're just making friends in our neighborhood, in their school, at our church. So that's been awesome. And, uh, and it's been great to pastor this church. Uh, it's an incredible group of people that are humble, they're faithful, servant-hearted like you guys, um, love the Lord. And, uh, and I have an elder board that I get to lead alongside with. And these men also are faithful, humble servants of God. And it's just been such a blessing to seek the Lord with that group of men and lead this church in that way. Um, we had a great Advent series. I've taken a lot of things from DU and uh, put them into practice at our church. Uh, we did a little Come Together Sunday, our own Come Together Sunday. In November, we had the tables out, and, uh, and we had food, and we were connecting, and so that was awesome. We did our Advent series, and Katie is thriving right now. She's leading the kids' ministry at our church, and she's doing an awesome job. And she's also preached twice on Sunday mornings and killed it. It was so good. So uh, that's been wonderful. And then this last, in January, I got to share with the church. Uh, we did a vision series, and I got to share the vision that God put on my heart for this church. The new name, new vision, new mission and values of the church. Uh, this is part of one of the reasons why uh, they hired me was to just kind of have a fresh start uh, as a church. And so we are going to relaunch on August 13th of this year, 8 13 23. So please be praying for that. Uh, we're going to be launching as One Church. So that is the name of our church, One Church. And uh, we are one family, united with God, pointing people to Jesus. I won't go in through, through the whole vision statement, you know, but um, it's awesome and we're excited about it. And everyone's on board. And so the next six months, we're just kind of preparing for that, reintroducing ourselves to the community, reaching out to people, loving on them. Um, so so God's at work. So it's been wonderful. Um, and what's, what's really cool about that vision that God gave me for our church is that happened here five years ago. I was in the United Kids area in the kindergarten and first grade room, I think it is now. It, was, it used to be the round table. But I was in there and I was praying and I was just seeking the Lord. And uh, I was reading in John 17 about Jesus' prayer that we would be one with him that he's like, he was praying for us, that we would be one, just as the Father and he are one, that we would be one so that the world would know that God sent him. And as I was praying through that, God dropped all of this in my heart here at this church. And so there's just so much that I have to be thankful for, for this church family. And literally, the, the seed for the church that we're pastoring now was planted in my heart within this body. Um, so God is stretching out his hand 
Um, and he's, he's doing some amazing things from this church family. So, um, and uh, it's in one word, it's amazing. One word from the Lord changed my life forever. Just one word. And that's the power of a word spoken from the lips of God. When Jesus speaks, it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be a single word. It could be a phrase. But when the spirit of God speaks to our hearts, it transforms our lives. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. The title of my message is just one word. Just one word. So this morning, we're going to be spending some time in the Gospels, uh, and we're going to look at how Jesus, when he spoke into people's lives, the most simple things, transformation took place. But the Word of God lets us know that we literally were created to live off of God's words. Like, we were meant to live off of them. Like, we need them as a life source in our lives. And we need desperately to hear the voice of God. Amen? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written... Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but the man shall live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I'm not just talking about the Bible, the word of God. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. We need to be in the word of God. We need to receive from God's word. I'm talking about the spoken word where God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, confirms that word in our hearts at just the right time, and transformation takes place. We need to hear the rhema words of Jesus because those words are a life source for us. Words spoken by the mouth of God are a life source for us as believers. And we see this in John 6, 63. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. They are full of the spirit and life. And then Jesus was talking to Peter later in verse 67 of John 6. He says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else shall we go? You're the, you're the only one who has the words of life. We're only coming to you. We need to stay connected to the life of God. Jesus came that we might have life, right? And life in all of its fullness. And that comes from his words. So if we want to stay connected to the life of God, then we have to stay connected to the voice of God. And it's amazing because when God speaks into a desolate place, into nothing, life comes. Just like that. No matter how dry and how barren it is, When God speaks, life happens. And I just want to encourage you, no matter where you're at in your life right now, no matter how dry the season may be, no matter how long it's been since you felt the presence of God or you've heard the voice of God, whatever it is, when God speaks, the simplest word, like what Harrison shared this morning, a simple word, life can come. Because his words have power. And he has this unique ability to speak just the right word at just the right time. How many of you guys know that? God knows just the right word at just the right time. Uh, Isaiah 50 says that he speaks a word in season to him who is weary. A word in season. He knows the season that we are in. Whether it's winter and everything seems dead, but he's reviving it under the ground, or it's the fall, or it's the spring, or it's the harvest, he knows the season of our life, and he knows exactly what word we need. And when he speaks it, and it comes from his mouth, and the spirit of God in us confirms it, and the season is ripe for it, and then we have ears to hear and to receive what he has life. 
Isn't that amazing? Life can come. So the question then is, how do we recognize the voice of God? How do we recognize his voice? Well, I want to look at the life of Jesus and look at some of his examples of what, what, what does he say? What are the types of things Jesus says to people? And how did he speak into people's lives when he was here on this earth, right? Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So how do we know God? It's from looking at Jesus. So if we want to know what God sounds like, then we look at Jesus and see what he sounds like, right? But one thing that we see in scripture is when Jesus speaks, it strengthens, encourages, and comforts. When Jesus speaks, it strengthens, it encourages, and it comforts. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 through 3, it says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Prophecy in the simplest terms is what God is saying. It's someone saying what God is saying. Like uh, Harrison today, that would, that would be a prophetic word. He was just sharing something that God put on his heart. You could say a lot of preaching is prophecy. It's, it's someone saying what they feel like the Lord is telling them to say in the simplest terms. And so if when someone prophesies, it strengthens, encourages, and comforts, then we can know that when God speaks, it's going to strengthen, it's going to encourage, and it's going to comfort. Let's look at the life of Jesus. Let's look at what he does. In Luke chapter 5, verse 8. So let me paint the picture here of what's happening. So Jesus was preaching to a crowd of people, and he's standing on the shore, and like this crowd starts coming in. It's a multitude, and it's pressing in around him, and he's like, wow, they're going to throw me in the water. And so he asked Peter, he's like, hey, can I like get into your boat and push off shore a little bit so I can preach to the crowd? And Peter's like, Sure. So Jesus gets in the boat, he scoots back from the shore, and he starts preaching to the group of people from the boat. Well, after that, he tells Peter to go out and to go fishing again and cast his nets out once again. And Peter was like, Jesus, listen, man, I mean, you seem like a godly man, but I'm a fisherman, and I've been doing this all night, and we haven't caught nothing. But because you're a man of God, at your word, I will throw out the nets and try it again. So he goes out and throws out the nets. You guys know the story. What happens? Huge catch. I mean, so many fish. He's trying to pull it into the boat. The other boat comes up. They're, both boats are sinking because of all these fish. And in this moment, Peter has a revelation. And he realizes this man is not just a godly man. This is the Messiah. This is the chosen one. This is the son of God. And in this moment, he has this realization. We'll pick it up in verse eight. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus's knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Just go away. I don't deserve to be in your presence. And then Jesus <laughs> said to Simon, First words, don't be afraid. I'm not here to condemn you. In fact, I know who you are. And you're going to fish for people. And all that was past, that's past. This is who you are. In that moment, Peter, all the guilt that he felt, you could see he falls to his knees and he cries out, depart from me because I'm a sinful man. And in one phrase, don't be afraid, Jesus calms his fears and changes his life forever. And from that point, he drops his nets, he follows Jesus. Just one word from Jesus changes his life. And then you hear the story of the demon-possessed man. Jesus comes on to this region of the Gerasians. Gerasians, is that right? Right. So he comes in, he lands on the shore, he comes up, and there's this demon-possessed man that runs out to meet Jesus. I mean, this guy was... Bad news. I mean, he was, they tried to bound him in chains. He would break chains. He was cutting himself. He was wailing among the tombs, like bad news, right? He, Jesus comes on the shore. The man runs to him and says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? And that's crazy, right? Jesus asks, you know, what's your name? He says, legion, for we are many. And so there, he's like this demon possessed dude. And then Jesus says one word 
to this man, the demons ask, hey, can we go out to those swine over there, this like huge herd of pigs, instead of casting us into the abyss? I don't know what that's all about, but they wanted to be in pigs. So Jesus said one word though. He said, go. And that man was delivered. Can you imagine how many years he was bound in demonic oppression? And at a word, go, he was set free. And the people were scared because they saw the demon-possessed man fully clothed and sitting in his right mind in front of Jesus. One word. The paralytic, his friends bring him to Jesus. He's on a mat. Jesus is preaching in a house. They can't get in. So they go to the roof, start tearing apart the roof of the building Jesus is preaching in. Nuts, right? I just imagine what that's like. Jesus is like, what is going on? And so they're tearing open the roof. And then they lower their paralytic friend on this mat down in front of Jesus, in front of this crowd. And they're expecting miracle time. Yeah. Jesus looks at the man. I just, you know, he was moved with compassion. And he looks at him and he says, take courage. Your sins are forgiven. And it's like, what? Not be healed? Why did he say that? Remember, he knows just the right word in just the right season. And in those days, illness and physical issues, uh, a lot of people said that that's because of sin in someone's life. That's why they had different handicaps or different problems is because of sin. And so can you imagine this man being a paralytic his whole life or however long and thinking, what sin did I commit? What did I do to earn this? I'm so sorry, God. I, what, what did I do? And the first thing Jesus says to him, and he says, take courage. Your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine the weight that was lifted in that moment because of one word? And then, of course, to follow that up, he's like, oh, by the way, just so you guys know, I have the power to forgive sins. Stand up and walk. He's like, oh, great. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jesus. I was kind of hoping that maybe you would say that too. Um, heart healing, physical healing, great. I'm all good. Um, but just one word. The woman who was caught in adultery, right? They drag her out in front of a crowd of people and they, tell, they pull Jesus in. They say, hey, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law says that we should stone her to death. What do you say? They put him on the spot. And Jesus, in his incredible way of wisdom and disarming them, says, uh, yeah, um, he who's without sin can throw the first stone. And then they're like, oh, never mind. They drop their stone and just walk off. So they all leave. There's the woman. I can't imagine how much shame she felt dragged out in front of a crowd of people, publicly displayed her mistakes, her brokenness. Jesus reaches down to her. He looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She says, looks around, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Can you imagine the weight that was lifted in that phrase, in that moment? The power of one word. And there's tons of other stories that we could share. Matthew, the tax collector, right? Most disreputable of sinners. Jesus has chosen a lot of his disciples and he's been doing miracles and crowds are following him. And in the midst of the crowd, he's looking for who he's gonna choose for his next disciple. He's like, I choose you, the tax collector, the one that everyone hates, the one that is the outcast, the one that everyone thinks there is no redemption for you. You're my disciple. And he chooses Matthew, says, follow me. 
the thief crucified next to Jesus, looks over, he says, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus looks at him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So in one word, Jesus calms our fears. In one word, he forgives our sins. In one word, he sets us free. He heals. He affirms our identity. Saves our lives. One word. And I think a lot of times we can overthink it when it comes to hearing a word from God. And we think it's got to be like this big thing, like this huge revelation. Like, wow, yeah, I just, I got this, I was reading this passage of scripture and as I was diving into the Greek and the Hebrew, the spirit of God showed up in a vision and then he said, this is what it actually means. And then I wrote half a book and this is the revelation from God. (laughs) It's like, no, (laughs) because he knows that we're human and we're broken and we're just kind of groping around in the dark and trying to grab hold of him. And we overthink it, and and sometimes it's just a word. But because it's in season, and because it's from his mouth, it changes our life. He speaks in a still, small voice, and I think a lot of times his words come in small portions. Chosen by the Spirit of God. So when Jesus speaks, we see he strengthens, he encourages, and he comforts, right? And then he spoke against the people who didn't speak that way. The religious leaders of his day who tore people down, who condemned them, who bound them. This is what he says about them in Matthew 23, verse 4. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And so he rebukes them openly, but sinners, grace, 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 strengthen, encourage, comfort, time and time again. And God speaks in a variety of different ways, and you guys have seen that, right? Just like today, I love that. Harrison getting up and giving a word, that was awesome. God speaks. He speaks through scripture. Sometimes he speaks in worship or in prayer. Uh, It's an impression in our heart. Uh, Sometimes he speaks through people. A lot of times it might be through a message or through a word of encouragement from a friend or a prayer or a book or something like that, or a song on the radio. I mean, the Holy Spirit is not limited on how he can move (laughs) and he'll speak. If we're listening, God will speak in so many different ways. And let me tell you, I can't tell you how many times, how many people in this church have spoken a word in season to me that transformed my life. God uses his people, just like Daniel was saying today. And I remember specifically, there was a word going into this season when we're going to pastor a church Rob and Daniel both spoke this word separately to me, and they didn't know that they were saying it, but it was, again, just a word in season, straight from the Holy Spirit. And it was two words. Well, one of them's kind of a conjunction, or what do you, a com- what do you call those, like, isn't a compound word? I don't know. I'm not, I didn't do good in grammar, okay? <sighs> a di- noun of direct address, I don't know. Um, so, anyways, but... I remember Rob looked at me and I was kind of sharing my heart of what God was doing and he goes, you're ready. And that, those two words confirmed in that moment, the Holy Spirit was like, yep, it's time. And all of the other things that God had been doing in my life at that time just kind of spoke into that word at the same time and it was like a release and an open door and he's like, go. Two words. And then like a week later, I meet with Daniel and he says the exact same two words. Just looks at me. He's like, you're ready. And it just, another confirmation straight from the mouth of God through his people. And that simple word, those two words set us on a course 
And it's been an incredible adventure because of it. So God's speaking. The question is, are we, are we listening? Are we, do we have ears to hear? Jesus talks about, do you have ears to hear the, of what the Spirit of God is saying? So how do we position ourselves to receive? How do we position ourselves to receive a word from the Lord? Number one, we make room to hear. Make room to hear. Margin in life allows us to hear God's voice day to day. Because if our life is so full and it crowds out, what happens is the word of God is what gets crowded out. So when, our, when we have too much on our schedule, too much filling our time, too much on our calendar, what happens when we have no margin, when we go from one thing to the next, when we don't make room for transition, then those things can crowd out the voice of God. So we have to be intentional to make room. And that takes prayer and it takes time to make room to make more time with the Lord. Look at this scripture in Luke chapter 8 in the parable of the sower. He says, the seeds that fell among the thorns, talking about the word of God, represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. All too quickly, the daily grind of our lives can grind out the power of God's word and choke it out. And so we have to fight, just like you guys just went through that series, Simplify. I mean, that, that, that is it, that's it. Believe he is for us. We have to believe that he's for us. Because listen, we don't wanna hear from a God that we think is going to smite us. We don't wanna be smoten, smitten, what, whatever you call it. I don't know. I told you I wasn't good at grammar. <laughs> so we have to believe he is for us. Not only is he for us, first of all, he's with us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. He has, he's able to bring life. It's not earned. His grace is sufficient. And he's willing. He wants to. He's for us. And the enemy wants to lie to us and tell us, nah, you did it again. You're not worthy of his mercy. That's true. We're not, but he gives it every morning. And his strength is made perfect in our weakness. We have to believe that he's for us. Number three, own our need. Own our need. Instead of avoiding our need or suppressing our need, own it. Just take ownership of our brokenness. Here I am, God. I am weak. I'm broken. And I have, I need you. I need your words. Own our need. That's what you see these people doing that came to Jesus. They knew their need and they came to him openly in front of crowds of people with their need. Unashamed, I have a need. Lord, will you speak into my life, please? Owning our needs before the Lord. Number four, hunger and thirst for him. Hunger and thirst. You see these people in the gospels, they were desperate. There was a level of desperation whether it was the friends of the paralytic, which that's what's crazy, good friends, desperate to rip open a roof for their friend. That's awesome, okay? Or the woman with the issue of blood who fought through the crowd to lay hold of the hem of Jesus' garment so she, she could be healed. Whoever it was, there was a desperation in them. They hungered and thirsted for, for Christ. And the word of God says in, Jer in Jeremiah, it says that those who seek me with all of their heart will find me. The prerequisite to finding is with all of our heart. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why did he say that? Hunger and thirst. 
There's something about our dependence, our need for him that we cling to Jesus. We're hungry. I, I desperately need your presence. I need your voice in my life. I can't live without it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. There was a desperation in them for the voice of Jesus. And then lastly, hold on to that word. When God speaks that word, whether it's one word, a phrase from a friend, whatever it is, hold on to it. Hold on to it, because the enemy's going to try to tell you to put it down. Don't do it. Hold on to it. John 8, 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you hold to it. Luke 8, 15, and the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. I can't tell you how many times God has spoken a word in my life, and it changed me, and it was powerful, and I just laid it down. At some point, I let go of the word. Even that word, you're ready. There's been times where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea how to pastor a church. What am I doing? I am not ready. And God's like, hey, remember that word? Pick it up. Hold on to that word. And it'll change you. Cling to the word. Let it transform you. Let it set you free. Can you imagine those people that encountered Jesus. How many times did that happen for them? Where that, the woman that was caught in adultery put down that neither do I condemn you. And she felt shame and overwhelmed. And Jesus said, hey, remember, I don't condemn you. Oh yeah, pick it up. Or your sins are forgiven. Oh yeah, that's right. Pick up that word. Hold on to it. So many of you in here, God, you know, as I'm sharing this, this just one word, you already know a word. Like God's spoken it to you. It's something you're like, that's the one that's, that he said to you. Maybe as recently, maybe it was in the past, but God's highlighted it and says, pick up that word. Maybe you've put it down. You need to cling to it again. Or maybe you need a fresh word from Jesus. Remember, when he speaks, life comes. So no matter where you're at, a fresh word from God can transform our lives and it can be so simple. And you could hear it. It could be one of the words that I share that Jesus shared. It could be a scripture. It could be lyrics in the song that we sing. It could be what Harrison shared this morning, whatever it is. But just that one word, if we hold to it, if we own our need, we come before the Lord, we hunger and thirst. And then when God speaks the word, we just hold on to it transforms our lives. One word from the mouth of God. So this is what we're going to do. Would you stand with me? We're going to close in worship. Um, I just want us to take a moment and just listen. Just listen. Open up our ears and see what God says. So right where you are, just close your eyes. If you wouldn't mind, just close your eyes where you're at. Lord, we ask, God, that you will speak. We're desperate. We're desperate. We need a word from you, Lord. And so, Lord, we just open up our hearts right now. We make room. Lord, we believe that you're for us. Lord, we come to you with our need. Lord, speak to us, God. Speak to your people, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Father. And so, Lord, I just thank you, God, that you are speaking in this moment, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. In Jesus' name.
And then let's respond and worship.